The Batteries Included podcast is brought to you with United Chargers. United Chargers presents the Grizzly range of EV chargers. There's the original Grizzly Classic, a powerful, heavy-duty, portable EV charging station built to withstand the toughest conditions. The Grizzly Duo, a dual-port unit designed to charge two vehicles at the same time. The Grizzly Mini, a small portable charging station built with an indoor-outdoor rated cast aluminium enclosure. And the Grizzly Smart, a revolutionary smart EV charger. All Grizzly chargers come with a convenient 24-foot cable and the ability to adjust the current from 16 amps all the way up to 40 amps. That's 9.6 kilowatts. Plus, they're IP67 rated. Built in Canada with the highest quality materials. Order yours now at unitedchargers.com. That's unitedchargers.com. Hello, and welcome to the Batteries Included podcast. It's February the 2nd, 2024, and this is episode number 22. Thank you very much for joining us. On today's show, we'll be talking about charging the refreshed Porsche Taycan, General Motors' decision to bring back plug-in hybrids, and Ford confirms NAC's adapter is coming free to owners this spring. And of course, much, much more. I'm Dominic Yoni. Joining us today is the ebullient Mr. Tom Malogny, senior editor at Inside EVs and host of the YouTube channel State of Charge. We also have the measured Mr. Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, which is available on all the best podcast podcast platforms. And of course, Kyle Connor joins us from the majestic, practically palatial halls of Autospec Studios, where he produces high voltage videos for a number of YouTube channels. Hi there, everybody. Morning. Good to see you all. Good all right. morning. So uh, I guess let's take a look at what's been happening this week and kick the show off with the EV News Daily weekly reporting roundup. Take it away, Martin. Well, the Ford CEO, Jim Farley, announced that the Ford EV Tesla adapter will be sent free of charge to owners of the F-150 Lightning and Mustang Mach-E, which will enable those models with the CCS plugs to use Tesla's North American charging standard chargers. Eligibility for the adapter will be determined by VIN, and each customer will receive one adapter. Customers get their adapter via a reservation process. Ford will cover the cost of shipping, uh, details on how to reserve them, and the tech specs not yet shared. But the activation, the charging, and the payment process we do know will be done seamlessly, they say, through Ford Pass or in-vehicle. Smart introduced a new pro spec of their electric crossover here in the UK, the Smart Number 1 which means the entry price is down by five grand. starts at 31,950 for almost 200 miles of range. Much like the BZ4X, the Subaru Solterra has got its 2024 model year improvements. They're gradually improving the charging time, 80% now, 35 minutes uh, compared to an hour previously, and much better battery conditioning, which means you can charge it in the cold. Well, the median range for EVs in 2023 is now... 270 miles. That is a 13 mile increase on the previous year. Tesla plans to release a new Model 3 performance configuration. No surprise, because it's currently not on sale. It was removed from the lineup, at least in the US, earlier this year. Everyone else that got the Highland, so called Highland version, had the performance deleted at the same time. A Tesla's Martin Viecker commenting online that the new configuration is coming, but didn't give us a date. Apple's VP of Hardware Engineering left to join Rivian. He was a member, a key member of the Apple team, having been there for 25 years. BYD announced the European launch of their five-seater SUV, the Seal U. It's launching in February based on their ePlatform 3 LFP cells, 800 volts architecture. Kia plans to launch their EVs now in sequential order, which is good for simpletons like me. It'll now be EV3, EV4, EV5. They were going to bring the four first, however. Uh, the next three numbers will cover price points from 35000 to 50000 US dollars. Japanese officials conducted a raid on a Toyota plant, a Toyota affiliated plant, after the company admitted to cheating on engine testing. Akio Toyota, the chair, apologized for the scandal and vowed to steer the company out of it. CEO Koji Sato apologizing for the combustion testing scandal, now engulfing the company, whilst data this week revealed they fell further behind the rest of the industry with electrified sales just 0.92% of their business. General Motors plans to add 
plug-in hybrids to their North American lineup, according to the CEO, Mary Barra, during the automaker's earnings call, which was a, a good, financially a good earnings call. The company are doing very well. Uh, she said that deploying a plug-in hybrid technology will deliver environmental benefits over EVs while the US builds out its charging network. You used to have plug-in hybrids, didn't you? <laughs> GM. Good. No details released, by the way, on when we get them, what they'll be, any kind of specs, or whether that work has even begun. That's a long development cycle that can take many years to bring new vehicles to market. Have they got something they can just plug and play? I don't think so. Right, in December last year, plug-in sales in France reached a new record of 54,000 and a half units, mostly thanks to battery electric vehicles. BEVs were 70% of the plug-in vehicle share in December, where it's now 30% of all new passenger cars sold. Things are flying in France. Tesla upgrading the Model Y in China with hardware 4.0, with a self-driving computer capable of seeing greater distances and five times the computing power. And Daimler Trucks of North America, Navistar and Volvo Group of North America, formed a coalition called Powering America's Commercial Transportation to accelerate the construction of a national charging infrastructure network for medium and heavy duty trucks. Very important work they're doing there. That is your update for what's happened this week. Dom, it's back to you. All right. How's that? Hey, uh, Tom, can you hear me okay now? I can hear you. you sound a little bit better now. You were a little low before, Don. Oh, okay. Uh, it was set for, uh, yeah, it's set to do it automatically, but I, I changed it manually. But anyway, speaking of Tom and I don't know, something, <laughs> um, I believe we have a, you have a little bit of a giveaway uh, set up to, to talk about this morning. Sure. Yeah. So a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that we were going to be giving away a Emporia charger. And I uh, asked uh, the followers to email me and uh, tell me why this is uh, something that you need and uh, also show proof that you subscribe to uh, Batteries Included here. So um, I got over 200 emails and uh, I read through all of them with the help of my wife and uh, I took it down to 10 finalists. 10 names are on these pieces of paper here. What I'm going to do is pick one of them. And then I will email you um, and we'll set up an arrangement for delivery. Now, this is for an Emporia 48 amp charger. And I said you can have the option of getting it with J1772 or the NAX connector. Either one, that's your choice. So let's uh, check it out right now. Do, do, do. We need some music, some, some draw music. Didn't think about that, did we? <laughs> we'll, we'll set that up. Okay, and the winner is Thomas Durkowski. Ooh, congratulations. So, <laughs> so Tom, I forgot we I had will, that in the um, system. I love it. So, Tom, I will uh, send you an email, and we'll set up uh, delivery. you got to tell me which one you want. I don't know if you're in the uh, uh, chat room here today. I don't see your name, but you could have a, a different uh, screen name. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll get you out your Emporia charger as soon as possible. Uh, we're going to be doing these frequently here. My goal is to maybe do this once a month. So okay. um, that's the January giveaway. The February giveaway is going to be a Grizzly Charger, our channel sponsor here. So um, I'll let you guys know when, when you should start sending me emails. Don't do it yet because <laughs> I want to try to have only two weeks of emails <laughs> to go through and not like a month like I did last time. And, uh, you know, um, you know, this is a there's an honor system here. Be honest. Tell me what your situation is and why you, you would like to get one. You know, I've, I um, I had such a wide spectrum of people telling me what their situation was. But quite honestly, and I appreciate all the followers, but like one follower has a lucid air and he got uh, uh, finally took delivery of his GM uh, Hummer EV. So it's like it's hard for me to give somebody a free charger when they've got two hundred and twenty thousand dollars worth of EVs in their garage. And they're like, yeah, uh, you know, I need I need a second one for the Hummer EV. And, um, you know, I, 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 I love everybody, but I really tried to pick people that need it. Like I've got I got emails from I'm a disabled vet. 
I saved my money. I finally bought a used 2017 Chevy Bolt EV. I've been charging on 120 for the last, you know, six months. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that, you know, those are the people that I'm really looking to help out with this. And as I said, I appreciate everybody, but be honest when you send me your emails, don't make up a a story. This is kind of like an honor system thing here, but um, I'll be getting uh, that charger out to Tom. I'll send you an email. Let me know which one you want. And uh, then we'll start one uh, for next week. We'll um, next week, next month, we'll do a grizzly and we'll try to keep it rolling all year round long with a, a charger a month. All right. Looks like we lost uh, Martin there. He's uh, I think his uh, this connection gave up the ghost for a moment, but he'll be back. Um, let's see. So the Porsche Taycan is getting a refresh, and Kyle here has driven the car and charged it up. And I believe maybe even plotted the curve. I'm not sure. We'll find out, I guess. So, Kyle, I've got the feeling you're pretty excited about this refresh. Uh, the Taycan is already one of the best EVs out there. So what has Porsche done to improve this car? Well, I can't tell you. I can't tell oh. you anything about it. I can only tell you range and charging. And I can't tell you all the details for another week. Okay. So a little bit less than a week. Only five days or so. Oh, so now. next Friday we'll... we'll, we'll... Go we'll have the details, but I can tell you about the charging because okay. the charging is crazy. I can tell you that it it goes, it's crazy. It's the most insane thing I've ever charged. Truly the most insane thing I've ever charged. So you More insane you, than I, Hummer EV? Well, on a battery level, absolutely. For the amount of range that you get, yeah. And the curve okay. is mm-hmm. amazing. I've okay. never seen a curve like this. I can't I'm tell you directing. exact battery capacity, but I can guess... Based off of all my numbers yesterday, it's in the high 90 kilowatt hour usable range. It's very weird restrictions on what I can and can't say. But I can tell you I did a range test in it yesterday, and it was pouring rain. Absolute garbage conditions, which is why my video was supposed to go up today along with everyone else's. But we had like the most – I mean, we were just a boat driving through water all day. It was crazy. So I have the keys right here to a prototype – big battery rear wheel drive Tycon and I'm going nice. to go try and get 400 miles out of it today. Um, so that oh, is really, my, yeah, that's that's my, miles. my goal. It's not going to be a standardized 70 mile an hour range test. We're going to have three people in the car, but we're going to go for, let's just see if we just drive it gently, not, you know, 40 miles an hour holding up traffic, but just drive it gently. Can we get, you know, chasing 400 in the Tycon and, uh, all the Porsche engineers were running simulations last night. Like, is this possible on the route? And the, yes, it's going to be close. But we're okay. talking a lot more range from the previous car. I think we can be pretty clear. Uh, right. A lot more than the previous car. And then the charging performance is, it's just crazy. Really the most insane thing I've ever experienced. It will peak at 335-ish kilowatts delivered to the car. That's the the peak it goes about 320 a little bit more than that into the battery uh and then of course ac loads kick on and it compensates from the charger for those but peak doesn't matter and tom knows this and you guys know this it's all about the curve and it dips you come under 300 kilowatts so from zero to when you come under 300 kilowatts is at 65 percent so it's just it just rockets and I added over 74 kilowatt hours in 15 minutes to the car. Ooh, I mean, it's it's going to be the new king of 10% challenge. It's going to be the new king of cannonball. It's the craziest charging I've ever experienced. So you you there's no reason, you know, old Tycon from 3 to 47% would give you full send 270 kilowatts. And it would ramp up because it was current limited. Now we have a little bit higher voltage. We have a 400 amp request from the charger now, and it just sits flat out from zero to 65. Nice. So get ready for craziness. I have the curve filmed. Um, I, I have it. Ryan's going to go put it on the website this morning. I literally did everything last night. Um, so I was the last group who got to go and come and test these cars. So, um, you know, you'll see some of the other outlets have some range stuff, but none of it is standardized range testing as far as I can tell. None of it's representative. It's just someone drove a car in some way. I don't really like these types of range things. You know, Porsche, of course, were, you know, they I think they respect a lot of the out of spec coverage. They're trying to get us a car to Colorado as soon as possible on the arrows to do the the real test that we can compare against other cars. 
So, um, yeah, this was the most insane. Yeah, it's just it's it's so next level. The charger. Right. What so, charger did you put it on last night? Uh, we used just an Electrify America BTC right. unit, a uh, new cool. one. Yeah, um, cool. you know, it was one of the paired units. We blocked the other pair <laughs> so we could get a good curve. And you know, I went zero to hundred and had a little bit of thermal limit. So instead of sixty-five percent, I tapered at sixty-two percent. Uh, under 300 kilowatts, but uh, today I'm going to charge it again and fill in the rest of that curve so I can get a pretty good uh, indication. I mean, the, the, yeah, this is just, I've never charged, I've seen cars that like Lucid has peaks at 351 kilowatts. I've seen Hummer EV, it's 377 I've seen now. Like they really get up there, but this, I've never seen anything just sit for over 12 minutes, o over 300 kilowatts. Did you charge them a can when you had it? Yes. And are you allowed to talk uh, about that? Yeah. <laughs> I, I never know what we're I allowed to talk about. I don't remember if I did. I, I have charged it, um, but it's um, not not like this. That's for sure. It's a pretty good curve. It's 270 kilowatts peak, and it holds right, this it the, deep. Yeah. 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 Two, 270 wow. was what, they, uh, what the, previous, the Tycon does now, right? The, the peak. So that's what the Tycon does now. And the small, yeah. You'll see all the technical details later this right. week, but right. so we we can be sure that this is going to be just a whole nother another league, not even in the same category. So, what, what do you think if people are driving like on a regular road trip and you're doing like a you know two percent to eighty percent, you know, on the regular? What, how what, how long do you think a stop at a you know on a road trip is going to be like? Okay, so let me pull up so the data. I, so when I did my road trip in the, like my Tesla Model Three, uh, long range rear wheel drive, twenty eighteen, my average turned out to be like nineteen minutes over like three thousand some miles, um, and that was a bit longer than it actually would be because a few of those sessions were. Uh, yeah, you charge you really know, deep. Yeah, yeah, most some people those, yeah, aren't some of those I charge, I charge like you. I think like the ten to the eighty is really more important. Very yeah, so few 10 people to are going to go down to two percent. Right. Right. Keep Right. Keep in mind, it's got, we can assume a much bigger battery than before. So 10 to 80 is adding a lot more energy than the previous car. Um, right. And so we 10 to 80 is about um, 16 minutes. So I forget the, it's not the official quoted stated time, but that's what I've observed is wow. in that region. It was, it was better than what Porsche will quote. Yeah. Right. Because I, I saw an eight to, eight to 77 I have, or eight to 79 in, 16 minutes so wow. maybe even better than i quoted yeah. wow that's nuts that's, that's just and the funny thing is you know when kyle's talking about this before he even said cannonball i'm thinking cannonball but kyle has told me that's it i'm done with cannonballs i'm not doing cannonballs yeah. anymore and, and and I, that's what he said i don't <laughs> says, i don't believe him <laughs> for no, as far I as i can throw him, him. No, this car, he's going to be drooling over getting this car coast to coast three or four but months I, from I, now. I, that's just my prediction. Um, but uh, well, you know, now we'll, it we'll, becomes we'll see. a real you... fight between Lucid and this because Lucid, yeah. uh, I need what would be cool is if I could have a Lucid today to run alongside this Tycon Ooh, because be I'm great. sure the Lucid is more efficient, they are magically efficient. Mm -hmm. But I'm also really sure that the Tycon can onboard so much more energy. Um, yeah, it's, it's gonna, this is great that cars are getting to this point, but we're getting into the, you know, Mac, you know, minimum road trip time with this based off the, the range that I observed yesterday in the worst of conditions, beating the previous car. And, um, today having looking like fairly good conditions behind me, I'm, I'm hoping for 400 miles with 300, with three people awesome. in the car. Great. Crazy. Wow. But not at 70 miles now. So what, what do you have? Hey, can you have a guesstimate of what you think it'll do and under normal conditions on your regular 70 mile an hour test route yeah my guess in colorado if we have a reasonably fresh car is it's not not going to be lucid territory we're talking uh maybe mid 300s okay, so that'd be great. But the, the previous tycon long range rear wheel drive both tom and i tested and we got roughly 300 miles out of that car mm -hmm. at 70 i think this is a 350 360 car at 70. big upgrade adding 50 oh, yeah. miles at highway speeds and just charging a guess. faster that's a that i know but if if it comes in anywhere 340 to three to, to 360 anywhere in there adding 40 or 50 miles and shaving 10 minutes off of a charging speed 
you know, to, to, to go further, that's ridiculous. That's just, um, that's awesome. Good, good the, on Porsche. Yeah, the car Porsche is be improving uh, their cars like this. I, you know, I, I had I spent the last two days with the entire engineering team for Tycon talking about all the little. So I'm, you know, my I'm full of information, which is great. So I know all the answers to all my questions, and that's the that's the most invaluable thing about uh, you know being able to have access to these folks. You know, it's something I only found out about last minute. I was a list, you know, I was I was up in uh, doing Honda Prologue, and then I'm like, oh, Tycon range test. Go let let me pop down there. And uh, that's what we did. It was great. Yeah. And uh, I can't talk about the chemistry changes. EVKX, I know, wants to know. But just wait a few days and I can tell you everything you want to know. Okay. There's chemistry changes, though, you say. No, uh, I'm that, not confirming okay. chemistry changes. No, but there, but there has to be significant improvements <laughs> in how they've fundamentally there's, there's, put you, this thing you together. Think so. Which is you, which I find it interesting because we have the new platform with mccann and q6 e-tron which i thought was going to steal all of the headlines and then we come on air today and we hear about this incredible tycon which is an improvement on a product that's already out there and by the sounds of it a massive improvement um or at least a labor of love for those engineers that have got to do this um amazing so a few uh about a month or so ago uh porsche set a, a new record on the on Nürburgring with the Taycan this is not that car right though is there is that should we expect that kind of like crazy performance of the Taycan refresh or is what's the can we talk about anything about that not till five more days okay. but not, <laughs> uh, okay. nothing on the crazy spicy one that you and I want to know about that that's not uh yeah not not part of my program at least so how did you so is everyone uh are other outlets down there doing range tests like what's it what, obviously yeah, the stuff you can and can't just, talk about yeah, it's so funny. There's yeah, I think they had maybe it's a global thing they have here. So the they had some German guys here. They had the Norwegian guys here. They had um, yeah, some American. You know, Edmonds posted their stuff. I think they had a car and driver, a Motor Trend, all the big you know mm. normal ones. And everyone's got their own version of how to test range. And um, yeah, I actually was with Patrick George who runs Inside EVs yesterday. We had a great time. But you know, everyone has a different calculation of what is range and what does it mean and and at least between tom and i we have a very strict understanding yeah. of how we conduct range tests so that it is comparable i've seen a lot of people be like oh i did this in the tycon i remember you know a few years ago i did that in an eqs and you know i'm like you can't this isn't how this works even um even comparing on our testing on different temperature days and different elevations drives me insane and wind well, wind is so such a huge control. factor. Yeah, yeah such and, a huge I mean, factor. We go in loops to try to offset that. But if one day there's 16 mile an hour winds with one car, and the next day you go out and it's three mile an hour winds, even with the loops, it's you know it's uh you know. But we 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 ex we fully explain that every time we do these. Right. So I think we do the best. Honestly, it's not just saying because it's me and you. I think we do the best, most controlled range tests of anybody out there. So. Yeah, we'll absolutely. I, I think so. Way. No question. I totally agree because we're not trying to show a customer use case. We're trying to show mm -hmm. comparability. Mm -hmm. And that's right. the goal, you know, that we're trying to uh, achieve yeah. here. So no, I think nobody we just drives 70 miles an hour, you know, like nobody gets on a highway and just drives 70 miles an hour no. because no. like that, like normally if you tried to drive 70 miles, you would slow up and speed up as traffic. But Kyle and I like dodge cars and everything so that we can maintain that 70 miles an hour, you know, and, and like, it's like, it's work sometimes. I, me, yeah. maybe more than Kyle, Kyle, you get some of your roads. I see when you're, uh, when you, when you live stream, you're just blasting along. Like yeah. I'm here in New Jersey. I'm like weaving cars and everything to stay at 70 miles right. an hour. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I do them in the middle of nowhere because we're able to, which is great. Yeah. But, right. but no question, this is a, this is a no matter, I think we can say comfortably the new Tycon with the big battery, no matter the conditions, it's a 300 mile car. Nice. Middle of winter driving I over the say rock. That about a lot of cars. Right. Yeah. No, yeah, it's true. It's, it's and like, that's but I would say the Lucid, as an example, a Lucid Grand Touring, I would always say was a 400 mile car. That had a, a you know, fourth, it did better than 400 in our 70 mile per hour test. But kind of no matter how I drove that car, as long as I was reasonable, I wasn't shredding canyons, that's a 400 mile car. This is a 300 mile car. Um, but no question, the charging that I observed here is far superior to the Lucid. So then it becomes 
you know, I, I'm not sure if people are really cross shopping Tycon and Lucid, but it, this is the fun stuff we get to play around with. So John Check has a question. When you range test, do you stop for snacks and bathroom breaks? No, me, no, I don't stop. <laughs> uh, I, I, I try not to. I might have to stop for the bathroom break once in a while. I haven't recently. I did when I first started doing these. But one thing, I drive on the New Jersey Turnpike. The rest stops are right on the turnpike. I literally coast off the, the highway a quarter mile, shut, park, shut the car off, and then turn it on and get back on the parway. So, it, I mean, it, it might make a quarter of a mile difference at the end of the range test. So, but, but very rarely, only with the really long cars. Like when I did the Lucid Air, I had to. It was an, I was driving for eight hours. <laughs> so, I, I mean, <laughs> that was nuts. But you're not um, Superman. Or... I, I, it, what's that? Yeah. So you're not, no. you're not Superman. No. no, and I ain't getting any younger. So the bathroom breaks seem to be happening more frequently <laughs> these recent of recent years. Uh oh. All right. Um, yeah. So, so it, uh, well, let's just move on. But that's wait for another week too. But the big story for me today, at least, is the charging performance. More than the range, the range that I experienced was in the absolute worst conditions. Other outlets had better conditions. I heard of some people on the loop getting uh, mid 360 mile ranges, cruising at highway speeds at least, going from LA to San Diego and back. So, yeah. It'll be nice to see more more cars get up in that range thing. I mean, people say we don't need that kind of range, but kind of do for a lot of people do need that kind of range, you know, just so they can just go and, and fill up the car like once a once a week, like a normal, like a gas car. Uh, that would suck you, if you have to drive an EV that way, though. I mean, well, that's just, a, I mean, yeah, this is the way if some people like really like driving EVs and they don't have a driveway, that's kind of how, what they're stuck with, right? Yeah, but then it's such a pain. Every week you have to fight. Like around here in LA, you can't find open chargers. You don't buy oh, a Taycan right. if you don't have a garage. Yeah, don't buy one of these <laughs> if you don't have a garage. Yeah. I mean, don't buy any kind of a money. Most Tycon you're, you're, owners uh, probably have a garage anyway, or yeah. just a driveway. I, you'd yeah, think. With, with most three yeah, other with cars, or a condo um, parking lot with a with a receptacle or I mean, whatever. So you mentioned you also drove the Prologue. Can you say anything about that yet? Yeah, I can tell you everything about how it, how it does not drive because I can't okay. tell you that, but I can tell you everything else. <laughs> uh, well, real quick, oh, I, mean, I mean, we can save a lot of it for later because we got lots of other things to talk about, but uh, yeah, we can wait cu for... curious. It's This is kind of like, so this is uh, the Honda Prologue is based on the LTM system from GM and GM is having all kinds of issues with their LTM platform architecture in other vehicles like the Blazers out of stop sale. Um, some Lyric owners, you know, complain about this and that, some having issues. So. What's the prologue? Is any of that is coming over to the prologue or is it all seem to be, I don't know how much you can't tell, or can you say how much uh, the software engineers at Honda have had their fingers in the all team sauce? Yeah. Well, I spent a lot of time in my video review talking about this exact okay. conundrum and okay. it's <laughs> really <laughs> concerning to me that a brand has partnered with a company that seemingly can't get electric cars out for themselves. And Honda is so confident in the fact that they can get every single one they need from GM. They, they say 40,000 in the first year or something like that. So um, it's literally a blazer with a Honda badge. Yeah. I mean, it, literally, it has OnStar. <laughs> it's, oh, really? it's got, really? oh, yeah, yeah. It's well, literally a, a blazer. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was really. Is it called call OnStar? Yeah. Okay. I was, yeah, for some reason I, I was thinking. I thought Honda like took those kind of systems and kind of put their own marketing labels on them. And no, they just kept oh. it all GM. And I think I can say this because it's not a driving impression. When you turn traction control off, it says Stabila Track off. Okay, which is GM's so nomenclature. So, it's so the lots of GM software. They've added CarPlay, so they've done some tweaking somewhere. But not much. Yeah, well, well, I think they the system the base system allows CarPlay and Android Auto. Okay, okay so they, so, but, so, so the, the GM decision that was a decision to turn it off and to disable access, even though it has it. Okay, I didn't know that. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, because both this and the Acura ZDX have CarPlay and Android Auto. And... Brilliant. <laughs> okay, but but I've I've learned quite. I I really don't know if it's worth spending any time on this card because i'm not so sure it's interesting yeah no we can we can move on uh because we'll we'll talk about this when the embargo drops and it's like in a, in a month it's in forever and i right. i want to just forget about it but i can't 
<laughs> that, that bodes well. Um, all right. No, I mean, no, it's not. It's not. I'm not saying it's a bad car. I actually think it looks great. The materials right. are very nice. Um, I okay. prefer it just on a styling, you know, non-driving impressions because I haven't driven the Blazer, but I prefer it to the Blazer. Um, so that this would be my preference if I had to uh, choose. Yeah. Right. And so uh, David Lutz is asking us, I'm curious to hear if Francie was able to make it across the country in Vinfast. And I am too curious as because I didn't even know where that road trip was headed. You know, I, I, I knew that she was with Jordan headed somewhere. This is what Vin happens when you get off of Twitter. You miss out I all know, the info. Right? I know we need to get you all on, on threads. No, uh, no, no. Just just use use X. Um, all right. So so to bring our audience up to speed, out of spec has leased a VinFast VF8 and Francie is, I guess, the prime driver of that vehicle now. And she's, she's taking delivery. How, how did that go? Like, the, so you've leased it. Was that difficult to arrange? Yes, it sucked. <laughs> um, so can you give us a little bit? Yeah, I mean, we did a whole video on it. It's, it's basically, okay. we went to the, the, the only non-corporate owned VinFast dealer in the country is in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I used to live. And so it was great to go back home and see everyone and, uh, you know, hang out in North Carolina. But I was there way longer than I expected because, you know, I had emailed and called them ahead of time and said, hey, we're coming, reserve us a red one because I wanted it for the thumbnail or I really wanted an orange one. They sold that. And I said, ah, they got a couple red ones, save one of those for us. We're on our way. And so I thought, okay, I called up Francie. She needs an electric car. I don't want to drive a VIN fast. That's for sure. So anyway, I, but I want to cover the car. So I said, okay, do you, I'll get you a, a, free, a free VIN fast, basically. You know, thanks for working for us. Here's a, you know, don't sell your Subaru, but here's a free VIN fast. So <laughs> we decided to may, either just meet in Raleigh and drive it back. But then I thought, oh, well, she, you know, is in Memphis. So I thought, let's go to Memphis We'll grab a Model Y. This is her parents' Model Y. We'll drive it out to Raleigh, which was a disaster because we got a flat tire and all that stuff in itself. And then we get to Raleigh in the Model Y where we were planning on just road tripping them back the same day. And the dealer's like, oh, we sorry. We sold all the cars. You, we don't. And I'm like, we just came all the way here. We had it arranged. What are you talking about? This is crazy. Then it turns out they were just lying to us. They didn't sell all of the cars. They had a software update bug that was stopping them from being on sale. And so there was a stop sale. They weren't delivering anymore. And I'm like, okay. well, that, you could have just told us that and we wouldn't have flown all the way here. And then yeah. they're like, oh, we thought you were coming here to see friends. We didn't know you were coming here for us, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, we came all the way just to get your stupid ass car so we can get <laughs> home. And it was awful. A terrible experience. And so, you know, that Thursday delivery turned into a Friday delivery, which turned into a Saturday delivery, which then their closed Sunday turned into a Monday delivery. And it was just lie after lie after lie after delay after delay. And it was so infuriating um, dealing with these people at Leith Vinfast. I mean, truly deceptive, everything. The people we spoke to were trying to be as honest as possible. It was like the bosses trying to protect Vinfast's image. I don't know. Anyway, right. they basically didn't want maybe out of spec to have the, the car. No, gonna, I don't think that was it, it because they, they weren't just doing it to us. They okay. wanted us out of there because everyone in the showroom, I'm sitting in the showroom for days and they're like, <laughs> oh, you know, what do you think about this? I'm like, it's a terrible car. Why would you buy it? <laughs> <laughs> so they wanted us the heck out of there. And I said, I'm only leaving until you sell us a car. So, okay. um, yeah, finally, at like the last moment, they agreed to sell us this thing but it was cool because i didn't want them like prepping a car or doing anything so i switched the car at the last second it came off the truck uh you know just a couple hours before we took delivery I said oh we don't want ready anymore we'll take that green one and that's the one we're having so we have a real customer i didn't want any funny not that i think they would do that i think you know at least leith the dealer group it's, it's a great dealer group it's just new vinfast store new processes really sure. not sorted yet but it's early days for them they've only been doing it for a month i think Okay. Um, and then they said, okay, but we still have this stop sale. We can't deliver you the car. I thought, but, but we're here. And, and so I, I said to them, to the management, I basically said, you can get a video that we're going to film right now that says VinFast will not sell us a car and that will make a great story. I'm happy with that. And we'll move on because you're not selling us a car or 
you can sell us a car. And if it's garbage, that doesn't reflect on Leith, that reflects on VinFast. So they agreed and they said, if you can drive it for 10 miles, the one we're taking delivery, just take it around the block 10 miles. If it doesn't break down or explode, their terminology, then you can take delivery. And I thought this really is great confidence in your product. So I drove it so gently for the 10 miles. I wanted this thing. So I didn't cause anything. It didn't touch any software. And we drove it 25 miles, actually, because I went okay. a couple exits up the highway, tried the lane centering. That worked well. A uh, really good driver assistance, actually. It's done by ZF. Surprisingly nice. Um, okay. And it didn't break. They sold us the car. In an hour and a half, we were out of there, and I had to fly home. Uh, between that time period, the software completely locked up. The car wouldn't shut off. It wouldn't chart. It wouldn't do anything within the first 30 miles on the odometer. I mean, it just really went completely blank. But this is not indicative of the experience Francie had on her road trip which I okay. thought was really interesting. She did a All hard, right. a soft reset on the vehicle. You hold the power button. And honestly, as far as I've heard over the last few days, yeah, there've been bugs. There's been little weird things. Every time they charge it, they say the battery's overheating, <laughs> which it's not. Okay. So I don't know. But um, as far as I can tell, the car actually was not great. It was buggy, but it made it back to Memphis without major issue. It charges acceptably well. Not, not good. I would never say good, but it's got an, you know, it's not a Bolt, way better than Bolt, better than Nero, better than Kona Electric. And it's, again, only it, the advertised lease rate was $250 a month, zero down. I paid a lot more than that. Colorado, we got a color, all these things, whatever. I right. just needed the car for content. I don't even know if they overcharged us or not. I don't care. Um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not like it was that expensive. But right. um, yeah, then, and they made it, Francie made it back to... Uh, to Memphis, I've, I haven't spoken to her. I've just been following her Twitter account. Right. Yeah, I'm curious. So is she filming a video of this trip back? Yeah, her and Jordan, because Jordan okay. flew in to take the Model Y. So they oh. did Model Y versus VinFast on the way back. Okay. Right on. Oh, I guess her in Toronto as well. John Lamb shares that they've seen five on the road in the past few months. That's interesting. I haven't seen any here at all yet, of course. I'm in Tallahassee, Florida. It's not the... Uh, the EV Mecca for sure. Um, so that's going to be interesting to follow, uh, follow this experience, this ownership experience, uh, and to see what they get right and what they get wrong, what happens, what goes wrong, what goes right. Uh, yeah. But what, on this trip also, you, you came across a, uh, you went to Hertz to rent a vehicle at some point, I think maybe after you flew out of here and you found a Hertz that is renting out the Silverado EV. Yep. And you There's rented a, bunch a couple of them. of them. Yeah, well, they had a bunch of silver. They had maybe eight Silverado EVs. Okay. And apparently LAX has Silverado EVs and other okay. places. So Hertz must have done a big order. We also heard of, what was it, 600 Silverado EVs being delivered to Caltrans? Didn't we report okay. on that? Uh, yep. I, I didn't, but... No, I think we did a couple shows We mentioned ago. that uh, two weeks ago. Oh, oh, okay. It's been a while. Sorry. My short exactly. memory. Yep. So... Um, Yep, that was cool. So yeah, I had a, a Silverado EV a 3WT, which as far as I can guess is somewhere around 180 kilowatt hour usable pack. Um, so it's the medium one, not the not the big boy. Um, yeah, because the big okay. one's 213, 214 usable. Right, right, right. There's three There's three battery sizes in, in the Silverado? It's been a while, I don't remember. No, four. I think it's one, two, three, and four WT that you can choose in the work truck. So you can choose a oh. single a double, a bigger double, or a, a real big boy Hummer Triple EV double. size battery. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, how, you've been in the in, in the Silverado before, so I guess you're familiar with how it works. Any any surprises or anything of note? Yeah, I mean, you know, this was the base. This is a work truck spec, so it doesn't have heated seats. The seat doesn't even go up and down. Like, it is stripped. Okay. But it's such a nice riding, comfortable vehicle. Um, with, you know, adaptive cruise and a base truck is nice and huge range. I could not do a charging test. I had the thing for to drive from San Francisco up to, you know, Sonoma County because I went for the Honda Prologue thing. And I 
I don't know. I hate riding in the little shuttles that sometimes automakers provide. And then you got to like yes. talk to someone about not, that's not a car enthusiast. I don't know how to do that. So I was like, I'll just rent a silver auto. And I got off the plane, I'll drive myself up there. And um, yeah, it was great. I mean, truly it was, it was really fun. So I ripped it up there. I told the, the folks like, don't plug it in. I, I just wanted it dead. So my plan was on the way to the airport to do a, a charging test. And I could, I ran out of time. I could not drain the battery. It has so much range, even when I'm full throttle, neutral brakes. It's a rental car. I was driving it like one. I mean, I would, I had this thing full sideways around corners. It was awesome. I was the first one to rent it. I got it with like 80 miles on it or 50, 60 miles on it. And it was <laughs> so awesome. much fun. And um, yeah, it was great. Yeah. So, and then the charging, I did, I charged it from 30 to to 80% or something really? like okay. that. Okay. That, that's all I could get it down to. And I, I almost missed my flight. So I at least have that curve. So when I rent it again, I can then, you know, again, it's nice to have multiple curves so we can overlay data to verify, but, but no oddities while charging. First time I've really charged a GM Ultium vehicle with no question that I was getting the right curve. It was consistent. It was smooth. It was full send and it was big power. It was never below 200 kilowatts. So this is the experience we need. Come on, GM Ultium. What's, oh, did it? So, it was great. So they can do it. They can do it. Maybe they fixed it. You know, I yeah, actually have I mean, one. You, you guys know how I complain about Hummer EV charging, how I charge it like 10 times and never got a repeated uh, charging event. I have one of the followers, I don't know from here or from state of charge that emailed me and he lives in Pennsylvania, not too far from me. And he's like, look, I have a Hummer EV and uh, it's, uh, you know, I have the latest software. The charging seems stable now. So he said, you want me to drive to New Jersey? And uh, we could do some charge recording. So I'm going to do that at some point soon with a, with a customer car. So um, hopefully, and I'll be able to compare it to what I had before, which was all over the place. So um, maybe GM's got that figured out, Kyle. Maybe they, you know, have Ultium charging now where it's not just derating, you know, going like bonkers and then dropping down to four kilowatts and going up to 120, then 80 and holding for a while. And every Look, time I've I always unplugged, seen, yeah. That behavior always happened when we started low, though. Yeah. And so this, I did not, I started at 30%. So I don't, I don't think we can be confident that they got it sorted. What I can say is I didn't know they could ever provide a consistent charging experience. And we at least see a hint of that starting at 30%. It was an amazing charging session. I got to tell you, this thing just went, I recorded it. And then a Hyundai Ionic 5 plugged into the shared charger next to me. Oh. Uh, and then, <laughs> then it was so funny. He charged up and left. He only got like, I don't know, 10 kilowatt hours. And then my truck went right back up. So that was, that was good. Interesting. Great. So All this right. is the work spec truck. Can anyone buy that? Or do you have to be a fleet customer? Like what's yes. the deal with this one? Just like any other fleet GM product, you have to have a fleet account in order okay. to buy one. So it is not the consumer one, but, and there, also GM is not really letting reviewers drive them. No, I was so I say, just, it's a vehicle we don't hear too much about. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know yeah. why, because it seems pretty juicy. And even though it's not the four WT, the biggest battery one, uh, I think I'm going to rent one from Hertz for like a month or two. They said it was only, I mean, it's ex expensive. Yes. Compared to if you bought it or anything, but you can rent it from Hertz for about a thousand dollars for the month, which for a, an so unlimited bad. miles, that's really yeah. not bad. So that's, I was like, I'll yeah, just go and rent one for a month or two and do all yeah. the comparisons. You know, when we have Cybertruck up there, even the the three WT has a way bigger battery than Cybertruck. Uh, Hertz doesn't typically let you tow with their vehicles, so maybe I can reach out to their media department and see if they would be like, oh, for the videos, maybe they'll mm -hmm. let it slide. I don't know. Yeah, but um, yeah, I I think it would be worth to have one. I don't know if they rent them in Colorado or not, but I can at least grab it in California, road trip it out, and then road trip it back to return it. I mean, yeah. $1,000 and unlimited miles, that's, uh, yeah. again, for what is one of the most interesting EVs of the year, I think, um, just gets, it needs more attention. Absolutely. I really want to cover the car, and it's just a shame that GM doesn't want people to. GM has no electric cars in their fleet right now. No Lyrics. You can't test a Lyric if you're a journalist. Mm -hmm. You can't test a Blazer. You can't test a, a Silverado. One. They pulled the Hummers out. Really? So, really? Yeah. Oh, there's no Hummers yeah. in the in the media fleets now. Not that okay. I know of. Wow. Right. Wow. Interesting. We'll be getting onto <laughs> yeah. the reason why I'm sure in a moment. Well, let's talk about GM for a little bit then. They held their uh, their Q4 2023 earnings call this week, and on it, uh, Mary, and it was a very good call actually. And they're you know they had a really great result in the last quarter, and their stock you know shot up. It's been 
GM stock has been on this like I was going to say a curve, but it has it's not a curve. It's been like flat for 10 years basically. It hasn't really <laughs> changed. <laughs> but uh yeah, with in the last little bit with a big stock buyback and then this great report is it's gone up a, a little bit, you know, it's like 38 or something dollars. But uh, anyway, on this call, uh Mary Barra said our forward plans include bringing our plug-in hybrid technology to select vehicles in North America. Let me be clear, GM remains committed to eliminating tailpipe emissions from our light duty vehicles by 2020, 2035, but in the interim, in the interim deploying plug-in technology in strategic segments will deliver some of the environmental benefits of EVs as the nation continues to build its charging infrastructure. Um, and later, she said, though, in a response to a question about how many uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles it planned to bring to the market, uh, that she said, we are, going to, we are going to bring those in, in at a time where we need them from a compliance perspective, which I don't really understand that so much, and that she would share more details uh, later on uh, on plug-in hybrid capacity and that they have the technology and they know the targeted segments that they're going to apply it to, but it's still not super clear what the strategy is here regarding plug-in hybrids i'm thinking she says it's coming but the focus and rd our rd spending right now is pretty much all on the evs right now the spending is all on on right rd spending is all ev the focus is on ev but plug-in hybrids are coming i don't know i've got thoughts about this but um i want to hear yours uh kyle i'm not sure how long you can stay with this so I'll maybe hit you first real quick what do you think about this well, um, it's kind of interesting because we just bought for my dad's channel a Volt and an ELR. Right. So he, you know, we're in the GM plug-in life now, right. and so I kind of. So here's the thing: I think what makes sense to me is with current technology, battery electrics for standard around town, you know, SUV, sedans, whatever. But for the truck stuff electric even with that silverado big battery that's not solving the answer when if you really are using a truck what i'd really like to see what i've been really asking for for a long time is an upsized volt drive train dropped into a silverado you know something that is primarily electric with a combustion extender now the ram charger they're doing that that's great right. that's what i'm mm -hmm. that's the kind of stuff that i like so I don't know. I think uh, my, I, I'm not a great uh, reviewer of companies and their strategies and their future, whatever they're seeing as as trends in their future. But I will say I can imagine they're basing a lot of their numbers off of their sales because it's GM. But they also don't have a very compelling competitive battery electric vehicle on the market now. Bolt has stopped. Right. And so they have nothing that is competitive in any category. And I wonder if that's where they're starting to feel this pressure to build some plug-in hybrids, whether or not it's because of customer demand or they can't engineer a better car. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Rem charger. I don't know if I said something different, but yeah, that, yeah that's no. the one that's going to be the plug-in. Yeah, I think you said Ram charger. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. Tom, what do you, what you got? I know you got thoughts on this. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I don't, I'm not a, a, a plug-in hybrid hater. I, I know it doesn't work for me. I don't need it. But mm -hmm. I know, and I've talked to so many people through the years, there's a lot of people that just aren't ready or willing to go EV, full EV. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to get past that, the manufacturers have to do a better job of explaining the benefits of EVs and dealerships have to do a better job of explaining the value proposition of electric vehicles because evs and dealerships now when somebody walks in and they look at this car and they're like oh i could buy this car for thirty thousand or i could buy the electric version of it for forty two thousand it's if the dealership can't properly explain why you actually might be ahead financially if you get the full electric version and also talk about the other benefits of of the electric version the sales are, are going to be diminished because of that. And we're seeing that now 100%. I can't tell you how many people I talk to that say, you know, Tom, because of you, I was really ready to get an electric vehicle. But when I went to the dealership, when it came down to it and the salesman was telling me, well, you can have this car for this, you can have this car for this. He couldn't, he couldn't push me over the edge for the EV. And, you know, I don't, salespeople don't care. They just want you to buy a car. 
they don't they'll sell you a car with any type of propulsion system but it's much easier for them to sell you the car with the combustion system because people understand it you don't have to work hard you don't have to explain the value proposition you don't have to you know talk about you know fueling cost and maintenance cost and and you know just the the, the time savings of not having to go to gas you just go home at night you plug it in so they're at a, a competitive disadvantage at the dealership like that and if the dealers don't do a better job the sales are going to slow down so i think for a lot of people the plug-in hybrid um, is a much easier decision because they can say well um i want to try this electric thing but hey uh, i've got to fall back here and uh you know if if i don't if i can't charge it or if i'm on a long road trip i ha i have this uh this backup system so i'm not against uh, there's going to be a period over the next five six years i would say seven years from now there will be absolutely no need for to sell plug-in hybrids other than as kyle said um some commercial truck use where people really need to haul uh, uh, tow very long distances a very heavy heavy weight but for me it's hard for me to see a manufacturer now say okay we're going into it now because you know what the life cycle is of vehicles how long it takes to get them to market and then it, to me it almost seems like they should have had this this strategy four or five years ago and then towards the end of this, this decade they would be phasing them out you don't see the chinese brand saying and doing this and we've talked about this before how the american car companies and even german car companies and japanese car companies to some extent or to full extent if they don't get competitive in this electric vehicle space they're they're going they're going to get crushed in in six seven eight years from now and we talk about Chinese car companies. They don't come here now because there's tariffs and everything. They're going to work their way around that. They're going to be mm -hmm. building factories in Mexico. They're going to be coming across the border. You know, if BYD, Lime Motors, NEO, Xpeng, a whole bunch of the other ones, they're going to be flooding this market in six, seven years with low cost, long range, fast charging, high quality electric vehicles. And if GM and Ford are still pimping their plug-in hybrids at that point, they're dead. And I, I don't see how they don't understand this. So while I'm not against them uh, bringing plug-in hybrids, like introducing more to the lineup, I hope they understand it's a stopgap. It's only for the next five, six, seven years. And they continue to, to do R&D R &D on their full BEVs to be competitive in four, five, six years when it really is going to matter. Now we brought up here um, a picture of the Volt EV um, and, and uh, uh, out of spec Dave bought one of these used lately. GM had a great plug-in hybrid in, in the Volt. The tech in that vehicle is amazing. I, I, I you know, how I, I did a lot of deep dives with their engineers, Josh Tavel and people that worked on, on these vehicles for GM. I mean, they actually, I'm sure Toyota took this thing apart and said, they just actually built a better hybrid than we did. How the hell did they do this? when 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 gm came out with that and it was better than 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 prius technology at the, at the time but prius had the name the hybrid name and i think that's why they really outsold say the volt at the time but the, the volt when it came out back in 2012 it was like a revolutionary plug-in hybrid oh, um yeah. and 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 you know so i'm not against it i hope they they start making some good plug-in hybrids i hope the minimum driving range is 60 or 70 miles if if it's under 60 miles these days it's almost not worth it to, to to pour all that money into it because you should be able to drive on pure electric on most days of the year and if the average american drives say 40 miles a day you know that's that's your average day that means a lot of days you're driving 60 70 miles some days you're driving 30 40 miles um i'd like to see them have 60 70 miles minimum driving range introduce some decent plug-in hybrids you know put the volt tech technology in the equinox which i i was screaming for that in 2012 they could have killed it they did it back then um but you know one of the problems i have with this and ford saying okay you know uh, the our electric vehicles aren't selling as well we're gonna we're gonna we're, we're gonna we're gonna go back to plug-in hybrids first of all gm how can they say they're they're and i don't know if they've said this i know ford has said this how can they be disappointed in their electric vehicle sales they, they're not making them they have some compelling vehicles, Silverado EV, Blazer EV, Equinox EV. They can't get them out of the factories. Um, so maybe it's what Kyle was talking about. Maybe it's a matter of fact that they just don't have confidence that they can build them correctly and make them work. So I, I hope that's not the case. 
Ford, it's a little bit more difficult to figure out. You know, they complained about their sales. The 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 um, the they set a record on the most bevs they sold every year. Ford selling more electric vehicles. The Lightning, yeah, it didn't crush it last year. It sold about twenty five thousand of them. It was the eighth best selling electric vehicle in North America. So it's not like the sales were horrible. Um, uh, maybe they just overestimated how quickly the ramp up would be. If you look at the annual sales of electric vehicles in North America, and I think we have a chart for that, it's not like EV sales are flat. They're going no, up no. every year. Yeah, and they're it's just not, not like, going up quite as much as it seemed like or something. Well, but... as, as it's, you say, as it seemed like, as who seemed like, look at, look at, the, let's bring this chart up here. That's, that's plug-in vehicle sales from 2010 to last year. Okay, right. are, are, are EV sales flat now? Are, 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 do, are we experiencing some kind of, um, you know, leveling off or plateauing where they say, well, this, the, the, you know, they're not selling as well. No, th look at that. If, if, if I was a statistician, I would look at this and say, geez, you know, it looks like they're just starting to take off now. It started in 2021 and there's no um, real sign that they're that that sales are waning now on this chart the dark green is pure bevs the light green is plug-in hybrid sales so you could see mm -hmm. plug-in hybrids are selling more also but mm -hmm. they don't sell near the, it, their sales are about a quarter of what purely electric vehicles are so when you look at this you say how how come everyone's talking about ev sales are down if you read any kind of news articles i these know days, it's like it has to say it, that if it looks talking... it looks like all oh, disappointing electric vehicle sales. Look at this chart. How can you say we have disappointing <laughs> EV sales? Did they expect it to just go through the roof at, in one year? That's yeah. not going to happen. It's it's always a gradual climb up. If if I were to look at this as an industry analyst, I'd say, holy crap! Like EV sales are exploding. You know, only we we sold double what we sold two years ago <laughs> last year. So, you know, it's kind of, it's it's all frustrating when I hear and read these articles of, oh, all the auto manufacturers, their EVs aren't selling, all the manufacturers are going to go back to plug-in hybrids because nobody wants the EVs. It, it that That's ridiculous. You know, look, at maybe they, these manufacturers just thought it was going to ramp up faster than it was. They've always been wrong. Historically, it's, it's amazing how auto manufacturers, this is their business and they have hundreds of people studying market trends and doing right. research and polls and everything. Yet they always seem to get predictions wrong both ways and for gas vehicles too. I mean, manufacturers are always tweaking their output for mm -hmm. their combustion vehicles, but you don't read about it in the news. You, you know, you don't read that, oh, you know, the forecast are cutting back 10% of of uh, you know blazer regular blazer uh, production, N nobody really cares about it because the industry does that all the time. But right. um, anyway, uh, it's it's frustrating to me to see so much negativity with electric vehicles now um, in the news when sales are taking off. So you know, throwing some plug-in hybrids in there, that's a good EV with training wheels for a lot of people that aren't ready for full bevs, but. Um, we're going to, the full BEV sales are going to continue to climb year over year. We're at that point now where, and I talk about the hockey stick adoption curve. And if you looked at that chart, it's kind of flat for a while. It goes up a little bit and then it starts to curve like a hockey stick. We're in that now. And um, year over year, we're going to see more and more electric vehicle sales. And if GM and Ford and, and Stellantis here in the U.S. don't want to sell pure electric vehicles, Neo, Xping, Lee Motors, BYD, they'll be more than happy to take your customers. Shang Um Martin, you, they sold they sold the Volt in uh, the UK, right? Yeah, the Ampera. The Ampera that's true. You had even had the better name over there. I well, in my opinion, <laughs> you had the better name over there. Ampera. That looks great. Uh, so, what, what do you think about this? Do you think uh, well, the market over there might be a little different. Do you have a lot a lot, a lot of plug-in hybrids over there compared to here, or is I mean, uh, yeah, there there are plug-in hybrids on the market here in the UK because the UK, unlike mainland Europe, is quite different in that our EVs have been incentivized through business use. So we, if you have a company car and you're allowed to drive it 
because of your workplace, you get taxed uh, because it's it's called benefit in kind. And so um, if you get a company car and you're allowed to use it to go get a pint of milk at the weekend, you know, it's a work van, but you can go do whatever with it or even just a, a car that you have personal use of. Um, uh, then we have a, a benefit in kind. It's it's you know it's like having any benefit from work. Then you you need to get taxed on that. Um, and uh, we are quite a high taxation over here. So um, the government killed that. It was zero percent. It's one percent, two percent. It's it's increasing through this decade. But it doesn't. If you're going to have a company car, it, 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 you're heading off. All right. Okay, take care. Thank you. All right. See you later. Okay. Thank you. See you guys. Bye. All right. See you. Bye. All right. Uh, it only makes sense to have an EV. So it's a lot of businesses had. Uh, in, incentivized to give their workers EVs and plug-in hybrids, and there was no incentive to charge them. So a lot of people have plug-in hybrids and never plug them in. So there was that issue as well. Anyway, um, let's unpick this a little bit. As I said in the intro, it was a very good earnings report for General Motors. It was. And so on the back of, hey, guys, we're doing really well, it was surprising to then get that plug-in hybrid news. As Tom says, it follows off the back of negative negativity from Ford, who uh, have just been talking up plug-in hybrids a little more recently. And so what we didn't get on that earnings call were any specifics. There was no plan. And that, right. I think, was perhaps the frustration that some people felt was we're going to be rolling out plug-in hybrids when we need to, as and when, and rather than oh, we have a system that we can put into our existing combustion cars. Because if you know half a thing about uh, making cars, and maybe the people on that earnings call that were quizzing, you know, the the analysts, I like those, the analysts uh, that ask the questions, you think that if that's their job, paid very well to understand the automotive industry, then they would know that you can't just throw a, a hybrid powertrain into a combustion car. Uh, you can create platforms that that, that 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 can have either a combustion, a hybrid, a plug-in hybrid, or a pure EV uh, inside, and you create that from scratch. The Koreans have done that very well with the Konas and the Neros, and so look, it's all very doable. But I didn't hear any detail like that of what are the vehicles you're going to do this with, and what's the time? For, is it is it this year? Have you been working on this in the background for three years, and here's our new plug-in hybrid range? And so that lack of detail concerns me because the car industry is a, as everyone knows, is a very, very long play. And so uh, CFOs, boardrooms, um, product roadmaps are very comfortable talking 15 or 20 years in the future. That's just the nature of the car business. And so it was odd to suddenly have this out of the blue because it's, Again, I'm slightly more detached from where I am. I'm at a distance to the U.S. Uh, it, it it seems it seems a little kind of out of nowhere and and a little hard to believe that they're going to be able to do it well. To be honest right. with you, because they've not done EVs very well, right. and so and so why would we expect anything different? Because they can do the combustion business really well. Um, so there's Similarly. there's that side of it, and then there's the other there's the other side of it as well, which is U.S. companies take up a a disproportionate amount of the negative headlines that I'm sure our viewers and listeners have seen out there. Now, in the US last year, over a million EVs were sold. Globally, this year, there'll be 16 or 17 million EVs sold. So with all respect, and I mean this with complete respect, because it's hard sometimes uh, for, for my great American friends to hear it, the USA is not a big deal in the world of EVs. And it seems like it should be because you've got Tesla and you've got the Detroit automakers. But when it comes to electric vehicles, as Tom hinted to, uh, if if the US decides we're not going EV, it's less, you know, it's about 11%, but going forward, it could be under 10% again now of the EV, of the global EV sales. And so what's interesting is it's not actually a big deal for GM or Ford to back away for a decade, because globally it won't matter. China will go EV and is going EV, and China is bringing forward its EV uh, predictions. It was going to be 25% or you know, 35% by 2030, and now it's going to be 50%. Like it's, 
China is racing ahead of even their own ambitious targets. And mm -hmm. the same here in Europe, the EU are pushing forward with, you know, Norway is pushing forward first with banning combustion. And then, you know, we're 2030. The UK had a slight change in the headline thing, but they didn't under they didn't change the underlying law, the mandate. So it got good headlines for the prime minister, but it didn't actually change anything really. So we'll be about 2030. The rest of mainland will be about 2035. And so what the car makers know is that hasn't changed. And so they have they 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 will carry on making compelling electric vehicles for the markets that want to buy them. And if the US isn't one of them, that's okay because it's still a big market, obviously. And but it's just it's not a deal breaker. The US delaying the move to EV is far more of a headline than reality. And that's the thing I'd like to remind everybody of is that you're going to see again through this year a lot more of these these headlines about the 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 growth is slowing. Yeah, but the growth has been 2 300% compounding and though maybe it'll be 150% growth. So they're taking those figures and there's a lot of vested interests um and uh, and it's going to be an interesting year for those negative those negative headlines and i think gm didn't mean to play into it but obviously they did play into that because all you know all the headlines were ah gm are giving up on evs and that's not what they said it's not what they said right. but that was the right. that was the interpretation it's not a huge deal although i found it a very frustrating decision for them to make personally because i'm such a huge right. fan of pure pure evs it it took me by surprise so i you know i kind of like plug-in hybrids i i i uh i uh, was a moderator at a forum we had a huge like uh honda clarity plug-in hybrid community there and you know they have great experiences but so this whole thing though i kind of agree with tom i think it was a big mistake for for gm to develop the uh voltec powertrain originally and come up with the you know the chevy volt which is a uh, you know, for its time, especially was like a, you know, a great technology, but then it didn't continue to improve it really and make it an option in other vehicles, you know, like SUVs or, or pickup trucks or, or anything. Like just the ELR, they stuck it in the ELR and, you know, under, they put a $70,000 price tag on it and it ended up with a, you know, gorgeous looking Cadillac that was underpowered. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it, I don't know. I think it should have been uh, more developed and they should have kept developing it and improving on it. Um, so, but since it stopped selling the only plug-in hybrid model that had in 19, it doesn't make sense to me to bring it now back now, five years later. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly how much engineering work they have to do. I mean, that's the thing. So let me just share this one thing here with you on the screen. So this is the Wuling, uh, what's it called? The Starlight, I believe the Wuling Starlight. And it is an electric car in China, but it's made, see, so yeah, it's electric Starlight. It's launching December 6th, just as past cheap too, 13,200 USD. So, but they make also, so they make this with, uh, in, in, uh, with, uh, let's see, SGMC is a Sino-American joint venture between GM, SAIC and Wuling. And this car also is available as a plug-in hybrid, which is why, why I'm sharing it here. Um, so the, it seems like they do still have the technology or, or a modern kind of version of it, at least. I'm not sure, you know, how that translates what they're doing now, because it doesn't sound like they're putting a whole lot of spend, you know, into R&D on plug-in hybrids, but they are going to put it in, I don't know. It just seems to me like um, it's, I, I just don't think there's a timeline for it really, you know, because with EVs really coming on strong, like if you have a, See, how do I put it here? The, the only way to take advantage of a, a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle is to plug it in every day. But if you can plug in a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle every day, you can also plug in an EV. And so I'm not sure why you, you need that, that handholding. Maybe in some cases, sure, it'll, you know, some people really want to plug in hybrid more than they want an EV. And I understand that if they travel a lot and they have in an area where there's not a great infrastructure, but uh sorry I'm, I'm losing my <laughs> may i also say remember that the dealers are enormously they are disproportionately powerful in the united states than mm -hmm. compared to anywhere else in the world and they've now written two letters one last year one this year to the biden administration saying we don't want to sell electric vehicles 
And if they are now sticking their head above the parapet and signing their name at the bottom of that letter, thousands of them do it, um, mm. in two letters now to the White House to say, we do not want to sell EVs. We want to sell hybrids and soft hybrids and plug-in hybrids. Can you imagine the conversations over the last two years between them and the OEMs? They will yeah. not have been pleasant conversations. And ultimately, if all of your dealers, because of the situation that you've got yourself to in the United States with a very, very powerful dealer association, if they're saying, we don't want to sell these cars. You know, we heard from Carl at the beginning of the podcast. They did not know how to sell an EV. Um, then, then the OEMs will I'll be careful what I say. I was about to say buckle, and it just sounds like it's a giant fight. And I don't, I want to, I don't want to make anything of fight because the inter, there's too many fights on the internet. But you, but you know what I mean. Like they have to listen. The, the dealers are hugely important to the OEMs. And if they're saying we do not want to sell them, at some point you go, well, we want to sell cars. We want to build cars and sell them to you, and you sell them to customers. You have to get real at some point. So a right. very very powerful lobby there has happened now twice with them saying it's not that we'll never go ev but our customers like the, the point the dealers were making in those letters were our customers are not asking for them they're more expensive than the other vehicles we just don't want to sell them yet right and it was i think it was a reasonable thing for them to say if i owned a dealer group of you know 20 dealers in a state somewhere i'd, I'd probably sign my name to that because i want to get paid at the end of the month that's the thing. They just want to sell cars. And they just want you, guys to sell cars. Know, you guys know that I did a lot of dealership training. I worked in a lot of areas. And the interesting thing is we'd go, I'd go into an area like, let's say, up to Massachusetts to train uh, six Chevrolet dealerships. And five of them would be complaining about EVs and saying, we can't get rid of these things. And then there'd be one that would take all their inventory. Like would say, you know, oh, you don't want those bolts? <laughs> Send them over here. I'll ship you over some some gas cars. You know, they they trade mm. vehicles. You know, mm -hmm. and and because that dealership took it seriously and trained the staff. And when people came in, they had uh, you know a, a a loaner bolt for somebody to drive when they were bringing their you know their gas car in for service. Um, you know, that's the the, the man, if the manufacturers really want the dealerships to sell these cars. One of the best tools that they can do is um, subsidize um, loaner electric vehicles at the dealerships. Mm -hmm. See, the, 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 the dealers have a, a certain loaner fleet. Some dealers don't even have loaners anymore. They just send you to a, 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 a um, uh, they have an arrangement with a rental car agency nearby. But if the manufacturers subsidize the, the, uh, the uh, loaners, let's say, you know, a, a, a Chevrolet dealership, gets three Equinox and they put EVs and put them into service loaners that are just for service vehicle loaners. And then GM says, you know what? We'll incur half your costs on on, on those service loaners. Um, but we want to see them on the road. They can't just be parked on your thing. We want to see, you know, at least one or two rentals a week for each one of them. So you're going to have to push them on, 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 on customers. You know, when somebody comes in, you know, hey, I've got an Equinox, you know, an electric Equinox for you to buy. Ah, I don't want that electric car. Mm, it's the only thing we have. Mm. All right, give it to me, you know, and, and right. getting people in them to use them would, is, is, a, is a powerful sales tool it demystifies this you know right. and um but they you also know, have to I, educate I, them too they can't just yeah. like throw them in a car they need to you know help them out with it, figuring out what's how you know how to deal with it how to live with it properly yeah so i uh, people are complaining that i'm low let me see if i could put my yeah, mic like yeah. up higher and over here how's that sound a little bit better i think i'm a little closer to it now I think it's so okay. um, maybe maybe tap on that mic for a second is that the one is, is it sounds not like being it's on used? that mic it sounds okay. like it's on that mic okay Sorry, it's on that. Pretty sure that's what's being used. Yeah, yeah. It sounds so good. I'll, I'll just talk a little bit closer. But um, yeah, I think that's a big part of it is getting people get, if until the dealerships get on board with this. And the only way to get dealerships on board with it is is money. The the only thing they care about is a financial incentive. The OEMs have to share the pain with the dealerships because they're shipping them the cars now. They're not helping them sell them. Um, a lot of the dealerships aren't asking for help. It, it, it almost has to be force fed on them, I, I think, at this point. And, um, you know, otherwise they're going to lag. And this is an existential threat for Ford and GM. I wholeheartedly believe that. I know a lot of people, it's, it seems, you know, impossible for people. We've lived our whole lives, GM and Ford, you know, we're, we're you know, these, these monstrosities back, mm -hmm. if you're my age or even older, 
you know, it, G, you know if, if GM and Ford, if it was good for GM, it was good for America. You know, people used to say, and they, um, and also, you know, oh, yeah, wait, yeah, I mean, they, they were, they were just, you know, cor you know, the cornerstones of, of American economy was GM and Ford, but the, 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 we're at this period now where the next six or seven or eight years is pivotal. If they get this wrong, they're, they're, they're going to be, you know, Nokia, they're going to be BlackBerry. They're, you know, they're, they're, it's it's going to happen, and uh, I, I hope it doesn't happen. But um, uh, yeah, and you know, one of the things that to to build on your point, Tom, is the consumer confidence, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that I think Jim Farley does incredibly well. And you and I have spoken about when they first talked about, and then when we we will talk about this in a moment. But the 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 Ford, Nax, Tesla adapter connector when he first yeah. went on. CNBC or whatever it was. And he went, yeah, we'll ship them free to customers. And whether that was a slip of the tongue or whether it was intentional, we don't we don't know. Um, I know that some people within Ford pulled away a little bit of were like, well, let's confirm that. And then this week he did say, no, we'll send them all free. Yeah. That gives huge consumer confidence on the second biggest purchase that all of us will make in our lives behind if we are homeowners and home purchasers than behind the house the car is nearly always second and there was my frustration this week with gm which was oh no uh evs no no you mean plug-in hybrids my friends that's the future and, and and that was the frustration which was the confusion, because those headlines are picked up on all of the financial channels. They drip down through them, and they get into the mainstream as well. And and people, if they're not super into EVs, they'll just scan the headlines in their feed. And, and along with all of the other stuff, they'll see, well, you know, G General Motors backing away from electric vehicles, which was genuinely the headlines I saw this week, mm -hmm. even though it's not true, then you're going to not want to buy one. Why would you invest your own personal hard-earned money in that when you think, well, I mean, EV is going to be around in 10 years. I think Ford do it very well, but we are, all, we are also living in an era where, for the time being in the U.S., around the boardroom table, the, the CFO, the chief financial officer, is currently pulling the strings. Now, there was a period of time where Tesla caught everyone with their pants down, and the CTO... And the product managers and the head of uh, head of electric vehicle programs at all these car companies mm -hmm. got a very big voice in the room because they were all worried about what was happening. And and for some reason, the last year or so, I, th I think it's going to continue this year, the realization kicking in of how massively capital intensive it is to do these projects, the wobbles that have happened around the boardroom table, the, 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 the bean counters mm -hmm. have got an outsized voice at the moment. And that balance of power has shifted and the big car makers in the US, not, not everywhere, are, are publicly having a wobble. And so when Jim Farley comes out and says, no, we'll ship them all for free. Uh, and uh, that is a, that's exactly what they all need to be doing. That's what GM, that's what Mary Barra did for the last three years until this week. Right. Although she couldn't deliver on her promises, which that's a whole separate podcast. They said we're going to be here with EVs. They never, ever came with them and they never delivered because they couldn't get it right. Um, and we still want them to do that. And we still think they can do that. So it's that confusion as well, which the last thing. Uh, add add on top of all the dealer stuff as well. You walk into your dealership. They're not fully on board. You've seen the CEO saying, oh, no, plug in hybrids. What are many people going to expect? Right. So, so the, right now there's there are a bunch of no, there are a number of plug-in hybrid electric vehicles on the market right now. So people can go out and buy like a plug-in hybrid uh, Kia, I believe, and also like a BMW. There's a, these few different brands have have them there. They can get them. The thing I'm thinking about with GM, I just don't know if there's that big of a time frame to make any money off of it. You know what I mean? And um, so I, I I just don't. Not that I don't think that they should, there should be no plug-in hybrids. I think for some people, you know, it's, it's fine technology. It's, it's I'm not opposed to plug-in hybrids on any sort of philosophical level at this juncture in, in history. Um, I just think their time is kind of limited. And uh, I don't know that Jim can make a whole lot of money on, on them in, the, in that, you know, five or seven years, I think when, because I don't think they'll make any sense in five or five years or so when we have we'll have a lot more infrastructure uh I, I expect charging uh better battery technology to be improved from where we are today quite significantly actually and uh i just don't think there's going to be a market so i'm not sure that's the you know jumping into that is like the and and to be clear like and to your point martin there's a lot of headlines out there about 
GM doing an about face and things. But if you listen to actually Mary on the call and Mary speaking, she is quite clear that, you know, the focus is on EV, but, and this is, I don't know, she used the word compliance or something in her statement, you know, not compliance, some sort of, uh, I mentioned it earlier, but anyway, it doesn't seem like she's like really, you know, married to the idea or really, you know, going to push them hard. But I guess if, if they have the technology, they can put it in some vehicles and make it extra option. They are getting a lot of pressure from dealers to bring back hybrids. And you know, they don't, GM doesn't sell any hybrids right now, like normal hybrids. Like personally, I think every vehicle they have should be, you know, electrified to some extent, like even like a basic hybrid version, but they don't have that, which, you know, shame on them they should have done that that's what toyota's doing and their toyota's hybrid sales are, are doing very well right now um but anyway there's a big bit of news i thought we should talk about it somewhat and I, i'm not sure if we've beat the horse completely to death but uh it does seem to be in a lot of agony i don't know <laughs> so uh, let's talk about something else for a second um last year Ford surprised everybody by announcing it was adopting adopting the uh, Tesla charge connector and gaining access to the supercharger network. Then yesterday, CEO Jim Farley, or was it the day before, uh, CEO Jim Farley put out a couple posts on social media saying that the twenty to twenty one or twenty one to twenty four uh, model year Mustang Mach E and Ford F one fifty Lightning owners will will be eligible to receive a free NAX to CCS adapter, and that the reservation process will be validated by VIN with one charger available per VIN or per vehicle, and uh, cost of shipping is included and details on how to reserve one along with the uh, tech specs of the adapter will be shared soon. So activating, charging and payment, once a customer has an adapter, they say will be seamless through Ford Pass or in-vehicle public charging app. Um, so a press up release was put up with that info, but it also had this little extra tidbit at the end that this is, uh, Ford owners won't have access to the entire, uh, entire supercharger network which we've kind of known, but this is what the thing is. Uh, so these, the uh, press release makes it clear that this is only for version three and up stations. So that means the version two superchargers, which peak at 150 kilowatts, uh, as opposed to 250 kilowatts for the version threes and version fours, version four should increase to more than that even eventually. Uh, those aren't the, those 150 kilowatts, the, the OG superchargers will not be accessible for Fords. Uh, but you know, all the other ones will, and that number is big and growing, even since they made the original announcement, we're up to 17,250 pedestals, uh, Tesla superchargers that, uh, Fords will be able to charge up. And that number is growing as you know, Tesla is very aggressive with its supercharger build. So Tom, you're very familiar with adapters generally. Uh, what can you tell us about this one? So the interesting thing is when, um, Farley first came out and said that, um, I immediately contacted Ford and I was like, you're going to give away a free adapter to, to 60,000 Maki and lightning owners. That's like, you know, $10 million worth of adapters at, plus shipping, you know, and, and they were kind of like, no, 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 no. We, I, I, you know, we're, we'll, we'll, we'll get clarity on this. I, that's not going to be the case. I think, I think Jim was excited about the announcement and he was saying that, you know, um, our customers will have access to, to uh, the adapters, and uh, you know we're not going to be shipping these things out. And um, I, uh, um, I even spoke about it here on State of Charge. I think I even wrote about it on Inside EVs. And um, uh, you know I, that was cl made clear to me by Ford representatives that no, we will not be giving these things away. Um, but now we turn out. I guess Jim doubled down on it and said, you know what? Um, I think we should be doing this, and we're going to do it. And he said it, so now you can't undo that. He could have almost walked it back on CNBC because it, he kind of said it quickly. He didn't tweet it like he did now. So, I mean, that's that's like, I think they've sold over 60,000 Lightning and mach -E's at this point. So, you know, that's that's a lot of adapters. And speaking of which, so you guys might remember about three, four months ago, I did a video with the A to Z um, adapter. I had a prototype of it and I brought the CEO on in uh, State of Charge and we did an interview. I just interviewed him again this week because now, they have the final production version of the adapter is is out and for uh, sale. Uh. And uh, they made a lot of improvement over the uh, prototype that I had three months ago. So I brought on the inside the uh, CEO, 
um, Amin Zator, as well as one of his engineers and consultants on the adapter, and one of the people that worked on taking the original prototype, making it better. Uh, they also worked with some of the OEMs. They sent all the OEMs the adapters and said, look, tell us what you don't like about this and we'll improve it because um, obviously we would like if you endorse it, you know, we probably won't get that, but at least tell us what you would like to see changed. They took all that in, they re-engineered it, and now they have a final product. Um, that interview is going to go up on State of Charge this afternoon. It's about a half an hour long. I think we learned a lot about the new adapter. Um, cool. And as I say in the video, I'm not here to pimp or sell these adapters. Um, you know, it's uh, if you want one, if you're interested in getting an adapter, take a look at the video. You make your own decision. I'm certainly not discouraging you from buying one. I think I feel pretty comfortable with this adapter now that I've really talked to their engineer, seen the improvements they've made on it. Um, I've actually seen some pictures, which I couldn't share, of the facility in China that makes it, the, the testing protocol that, that, that went into it. And, um, you know, I, I think they made a lot of serious upgrades and uh, I'm going to be using this one on my cars and testing the heck out of it. I'm going to pretty much get all the adapters um, and uh, I'll be getting one from Ford and, and Rivian. I own a Rivian and Ford. Both companies said they're going to give them away. Nice. I, I don't think that's going to be protocol for all the companies. I do not see companies giving these away. I think it's just kind of like a um, so Ford and maybe Rivian almost feel bad. Like we've been selling you these EVs the last two years and now we're switching the connector. But like moving on from now on, it's public knowledge. The EVs are going to be changing to the NAC. So that's kind of on you, you know? So um, I don't think, I think you're going to be buying these adapters. I mean, heck, look at how many car companies don't even give you a level one charger with the car anymore. So they're yeah. not going to give you a $200 adapter. I don't believe so at least. So, but um I'll be testing all of them. And uh, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about this guy here, check out State of Charge this afternoon. That video will be going up. That's something that I've been thinking about because Ford really kicked off the gold rush of announcements of everyone doing this. Do you think by Jim saying we're going to give the adapter away for free, do you think that causes some headaches this weekend around the boardroom table? Uh, elsewhere? Of course it does. Everybody's talking. Everybody's like, oh, do we do this now? And, you know, because um, if not, you're a cheapskate, right? Because yeah, Ford right. will do it. Yeah. It'd be a lot easier for GM to do it because that, well, no, I was going to say because they haven't sold any EVs, but they would have to backtrack on bolts and they sold a lot yeah, of bolts. A lot of bolts. So, yeah. yeah. And somebody asked me about the price. It's $197 right now. At, this um, this yeah. should just not, um, so they shouldn't do that to the Tesla supercharger network. <laughs> and here's so, the thing says about the it. Tesla so, owner. So, so I even had some like true. the the thing yeah. about the thing about this is, let's say all the Rivian and Ford customers are going to be shipping them. They're going to be getting them. Don't think you're going to get this like in a week, because yeah. the, the, no, no. The, between Rivian and Ford owners, there's, there's probably eighty thousand of these things, seventy thousand or so of them that um that need to be uh, sent out. There's no way they'll make them that fast. So. I even think that some people that are, say, Ford customers are going to run out and buy one and, and then just get the other one free and figure like, well, it's, it's better to have two in case one breaks or I can, you know, whatever. Because, the, the, you know, you're, if you remember when the CCS1 adapter came out for Tesla owners first, so they could use CCS1, Tesla was like perpetually out of stock on them. People were going like every day and checking, you were refreshing. And it was like they sold the first 5,000 they made and then they got back ordered and they stopped selling them. So I think that's going to happen again. I think it's going to, I think it's going to take like six months for Ford to actually ship them out to all their, mm. to all their customers. I mean, I hope I'm wrong, but um, you know, it's, don't think if you have a Ford vehicle, you're, you're going to get this in it. Like as soon as you put in your VIN and say, I want one. Um, right. I think, I think it's going to take a long time because the, 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 first of all, the company that's providing them to Ford, um, you know, isn't going to just take their first 80,000 or 70,000 of them and just give them to Ford. They're going to want to be doing retail sales too, because they're going to get more money selling them to retail customers. So right. we, we assume that's Tesla. We assume that Ford has made the deal because Tesla's making their own adapter. Um, and so are a bunch of other companies. So um, I haven't heard of anybody signing a deal yet with with, with with Ford or Rivian or who's uh, to sell them. Um, so I'm assuming they're all Tesla, but I do know that all of the companies are trying to get the OEMs to certify their adapter as like, okay, we, we can, we, we'll give you this um, to our customers because it's safe and it's made well. But um, 
we'll, 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 I'll stay on top of that. I'm also, Electron is going to be making one also. Uh, they actually right. just started advertising it. I'm going to be interviewing their company also this week. And that interview is going to probably be up on State of Charge next week. So um, I'm That's going to really stay on top of this adapter. adapter stuff and try to figure out which ones are the best ones made, which ones are mm -hmm. robust. So mm -hmm. people, you know, don't buy a junk one. And, right. and Tom, in the Ford Pass app, because I haven't got that, will it mean it's as seamless as, as a supercharger? As in, do you have all your billing in there? Will it just be a case of rock on up and plug in and walk away? I think that's what it's supposed to be. And, yeah, I hear um, that. You know, towards the end of February, we, under, we understand that Tesla is going to be opening up, like saying, okay, on our end, we can accept the, these other vehicles that agreed to, uh, to, 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 to do this with us. But now I think we're going to be waiting for the companies, the Fords and the GMs, to get their back end done, their app ready, so so that they can um, you know use it. So I think what we're going to see is the end of this month, Tesla's going to be like, okay, you can use our superchargers, <laughs> and the the uh, Ford and GM are going to be like, no, our customers can't use them yet. We're not ready, you know. Um, wow, yeah. Because I think Ford is still targeting spring. For, uh, right. for 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 and that's what they said all along. I haven't heard anything differently. Um, but we did hear from Tesla that the end of February their end would be ready to go. Right. We heard there was that meeting in California somewhere where uh, and a Tesla employee mentioned that uh, said something about to the effect that this would be happening in February. But that wasn't Ford's uh, communication at all. So no, sp no. spring is. So, but expectations were kind of set back then a little bit, you know, because there was headlines everywhere, February. Yeah. But yeah. no, it's that's not happening. It looks like yeah. it looks like it's going to be March or April mm -hmm. sometime. It'll well, happen we'll sometime. Spring, but, you know, uh, you know, right. it's spring is what right. we. The, I I reached out to Ford to try to confirm that, and they said mm -hmm. nothing has changed on our end. Mm -hmm. We we said spring in the beginning. We're sticking with spring. We'll let you know when if that changes. Okay. Right. Happy Christmas it reminds us it will be crowded at the superchargers right now. I have seen lines right. where you had to wait five minutes for a stall to open. I am not liking that. I mean, hear it that already frustration. is. And, right. and not, ju not just over the holiday season as well. In many right. places it is. They're queuing already. Right. And, uh, and where do they take up two spaces? Uh, I mean, Tesla's yeah. still, still yeah. like putting out the superchargers. They make them in, you know, they make them fast. They make they put up, I mean, they just install way more even now than the, the other two networks, maybe combined. So I, I think they'll eventually, I think they've got to catch up to the demand, right? But mm -hmm. anyway, we're just about, we're, yeah, we're up against our clock here. But uh, I just wanted to mention that the uh, Volvo EX30 that a lot of people are very excited about, it's been delayed a little bit, but I think it's only going to be Europe and only by a couple of weeks, it looks like. So looking through the uh, communications last night, it looks like it, we're still on for the mid 2024 in the US for the uh, Volvo EX30. So don't worry if you see some headlines about delays. There is, looks like a couple weeks of delay in in Europe. Mm. And of course they've also had the uh, EX90s delayed since like last, it was supposed to be out by now, but now it's also delayed because, of, and these are both software issues, which, you know, just underlines that software is difficult for everybody. Mm. Oh. Well, we, Sorry, guys. Go, One no, more thing ahead, I Tom. wanted to bring up about the adapter. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it it we keep just talking about supercharger access, supercharger access. You have to remember all of the networks, Electrify America, EVgo, mm -hmm. ChargePoint, they're all adding NACS connectors to their stations. So yeah. these adapters will work there also. So, you know, it's it's uh, the, the, you, it's not just supercharger access. You'll also have, be able to, you know, I mean, you you'd be able to plug in a CCS vehicle there also, but uh, just just so you know, these adapters are designed to work with with uh, the system anywhere, not just Tesla uh, superchargers. Which, if you are on a seam a more seamless experience, as as crazy as this might sound, if using the Nax connector is either quicker and it saves me five seconds, or is more seamless, or the billing happens all in one place and is more convenient. It would be crazy that you turn up to a station that's got both a CCS and, an, and a NAX cable, and that you're getting your adapter out and not using the, you know, and using that, but it might be a better experience than, which is odd because I see our friend Brandon Flash, when he's in the right mood, trying to re reply to people on Twitter, uh, when they go, oh, the Tesla protocol is is just way better than CCS, and he knows more about charging than anyone. And he's like, 
it, Tesla is CCS. It's all built on the same it's, thing. It's Tesla same is CCS. Thing. Like it's not. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. They're not two separate things. So uh, when he's in a generous mood, he's nice to people and's like, you know, trying to educate the Tesla fanboys. Um, but it'll be because it, but it does genuinely work better. So be interesting to see how people use those stations. I think Tom, that's the point that that doesn't get talked about very much. We all talk about the adapters. We don't ever talk about the fact that there's going to be new chargers in the ground with these cables natively. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's true. It's a really good point. You have a nice kit. Your kitty's coming to visit you in the background. I don't know if you know that, Martin, but oh, hello! Yeah, it's one of one of two black cats that we have. Two little rescue cats that we have that make my life hell. About six a.m. when they want feeding. Right. All right. Oh, just really quick. Uh, speaking of adapters, really quick. Uh, Bjorn Nyland has a really cool video this week where he uh, he t tried out the Hi Fi Z, which is a uh, an electric sports car from China is like bonkers, kind of crazy. But he had to charge it with a with an adapter from the uh, the Chinese standard to fit CCS, the European CCS uh, uh, charger. That that thing has got its own battery inside of it. It's just crazy, Tom. If you haven't seen it, you, you should go check that out. Yeah, you'll, you'll, that. yeah. But anyway, I think that brings us to the end of our show. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them below or get in touch with us with us on the social media platform of your choice. Uh, don't forget, if you like the show, please give us a thumbs up, uh, click subscribe, tap that bell icon for notifications because we'll be coming up in midweeks. Um, and thank you all very much for joining us and we'll see you all again next time. Ciao.